The term no man's land is most commonly associated with the First World War. Although the phrase actually dates all the way back to the 14th century, it's generally thought of as a military term. No man's land represented the area of ground between opposing armies. And in the case of World War I, it referred specifically to the space between the two opposing sides' trenches. And for newly arrived novice soldiers, no man's land held a, a certain curiosity about it. It's for that reason that these soldiers were cautioned against the natural tendency to want to peer over the top of the trench into no man's land. And there were a lot of these men who died on their first day in the trenches as a result of a precisely aimed sniper's bullet. The exact location of no man's land changed and fluctuated as the war changed. As the front lines shifted, then so did the space between those trenches. But in World War I, it was most static along the trenches of the Western Front, where from late 1914 until the spring of 1918, the war seemed to shift almost daily. No Man's Land was also the space where both sides ventured into at night. During the nightfall, each side would dispatch parties to spy on the enemy and to repair or extend barbed wire posts. During the night, reconnaissance missions took place. During the night, injured men trapped in No Man's Land would often be brought back under the cover of darkness. And it was during the night that those who had been killed would be brought back where they would then be sent home for a proper burial. Consequently, artillery shelling of no man's land was common, quickly reducing it to a barren wasteland filled with mud-soaked craters and the corpses of the dead soldiers. And maybe our takeaway from all of that is that the most dangerous place during any battle is right between the two warring sides. And in a sense, that is exactly where the nation of Israel found themselves in 1 Kings chapter 18. They found themselves stuck in no man's land. Now, Elijah was God's prophet, and he had seen that a defining moment had come in the life of Israel. Elijah had seen God trying very hard to get King Ahab's attention. And along with his queen Jezebel, they had corrupted the worship life of Israel, and as crazy as this might sound, Israel was promoting the worship of Baal. Now, Baal was a Canaanite deity probably introduced to them by Jezebel. And in artistic depictions and archaeological finds, Baal took the shape of a bull or a ram and has associations with fertility. And according to Canaanite lore, Baal had control over a woman's fertility, the sun and thunder. And because he was seen as the god of fertility, the worship of this Canaanite god involved a number of things that went directly against God's teachings. Now, Ahab was the seventh king of Israel and Queen Jezebel was his wife. She was a, a Sidian woman. We find out in 1 Kings chapter 16 that Ahab had become the king of Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. And we know that Ahab reigned for 22 years from around 871 BC to 852 BC. It was during these years that he ordered that a, a house of worship be built for Baal in the town of Samaria, likely at the request of Jezebel, and they even made her father the high priest of Baal worship in all of Israel. The long and the short of it was that Jezebel had brought with her some of the gods from her country, and the nation of Israel was stuck between this foreign God and the one they knew as the one true God. They were struggling with who to worship and even with how to worship. And as you can imagine, God was not happy with this. And the Lord had been trying very hard to get King Ahab's attention. But Ahab was obviously a slow learner and he refused to see the signs that God was placing right in front of him. In fact, God had withheld the rain for three years and the land had been left parched and dried up. God had withheld food and the people were starving. He had caused the livestock to get sick and to start dying. And the people had even started to rebel against King Ahab. But still, he didn't seem to understand the connection between his idolatry 
and the suffering of his people. It didn't sink in that it was what he was doing that was causing God's punishment. And so Elijah saw that it was time for a wake-up call. It was time for God to do something more drastic. And it was time for God to make a statement. And it was all going to happen on Mount Carmel. And Elijah challenged the 450 priests of Baal to a showdown. And in verse 20 of 1 Kings chapter 18, this is what we're told happened. So Ahab sent word through all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. But then Elijah went before the people of Israel and said this, How long will you waver between two options? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. I'm wondering, do you find that interesting? Do you, like me, wonder how the Israelites, these chosen people of God, could be so quick to look to another God? Do you wonder how they could be so quick to turn their back on their God to follow this charismatic, contemporary new king and his beautiful wife? Do you wonder how they could make the shift from worshiping their God to worshiping this foreign idol? And you ever wonder what it would take for you to turn your back on the one true God and throw your full support behind another movement? I think that we're given some clues here in this passage as to how all of that happened. And what we're told is that the nation of Israel had been spending far too much time in no man's land. You know, that section of land that isn't occupied by either side. You have God's side over here and Baal's side over there, and you are stuck between them. And on the surface, it may feel like a neutral place to be. But in reality, no man's land is the most dangerous area of ground for you to be standing on. Remember, Elijah said to them, how long will you waver between two options? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And the people had been living in this middle space for so long that we're told that they didn't even know how to respond to Elijah. We're told that the people said nothing. I think that they wanted to stay neutral because that felt like the safest place to be. But Elijah was about to force them into making a decision. The story goes on and we're told this in verse 22, that Elijah addresses the people again. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but do not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. So do you see where this is going? Verse 24 continues and we read, Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. And if you take a step back and and look at where the Israelites were standing, I mean, they were absolutely in no man's land. They were staring down the God who had delivered them from slavery in Egypt on one side, and they were staring down this Canaanite God on the other. And although they felt safe being there, Elijah was telling them to choose their side. This was the day that they needed to make their decision. You know, there's an ancient Israelite fable told to kids about a hungry donkey that was put between two bundles of hay. It looked at one and then it looked at the other and couldn't decide which to eat first until eventually it died of starvation. And Elijah's telling the people that they've been starving in their disobedience for too long and that it was time for them to get out of no man's land and to choose this day who they were going to worship and serve. Luke 16, 13 tells us, you know, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And please note that the emphasis in Elijah's challenge is this. It is either you follow God or you follow Baal. You can't choose both. 
And Elijah even gives the, the prophets of Baal first dibs. He says, you choose first. And in verse 25, we read this. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. Verse 26. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. So Elijah started by saying, since there are so many of you and only one of me, why don't you go first? So they went through all the ceremonial motions of preparing a bull for sacrifice. They placed the bull on the altar. They go through their sacred Canaanite liturgy. They recite their sacred words. They offer up their sacred prayers. They begin crying out in their pagan worship. And they say all the right things, do all the right things, and fully expect that their God is going to come through for them. We're told that they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, which probably worked out to about six hours. Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response and no one answered. And it was only after that that Elijah began to engage with them a little bit more. Now, I don't always recommend that you deal with false prophets this way, but there might be more happening here than we realize on the surface. Elijah is standing on the sidelines, likely with his arms folded, grinning, and he decided to help things along. And Elijah begins to, to mock what they are doing. In verse 27, it tells us, At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Some translations even add, maybe he had to go to the bathroom or maybe he was on the toilet. And what comes out much clearer in the original language that this was written in is that Elijah's doing so much more than just taunting the prophets of Baal. Elijah's doing so much more than embarrassing these men. And I'm sure that as he shouted out these comments, he's alternating between looking at the prophets of Baal and then looking back at the Israelites, those undecided people living in no man's land. I think that Elijah is making this very personal. He's not just mocking the prophets, but he's really mocking Baal himself. And so far, Baal has given no sign of even showing up for this showdown. And I think that Elijah wanted to make the point that faith and sincerity mean absolutely nothing when that faith is in the wrong place. These false prophets had faith, and I'm sure they were very sincere in their rituals and their prayers, but their faith was in the wrong place. Well, then it was God's turn, and try and picture this as we read, starting in verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. And they came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two sheaths of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Verse 34, do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed. And this is what he prayed. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and I am your servant, 
and have done all the things you've commanded. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. And then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. So picture this. After the prophets of Baal had their turn, it was now Elijah's turn to take his place at the altar of the Lord. The altar had always been a place of worship for the people of Israel, a place where the people would remember what God had done. And it seems almost symbolic that when Elijah approaches it, it was broken, just like the nation of Israel was broken. We're told that Elijah starts to repair the altar using 12 stones, each one representing one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now imagine that as he takes each stone and slowly and methodically fixes the altar with it, I imagine that he has his gaze fixed on the Israelites and he restores the altar to a place of worship that it was intended to be. The nation of Israel was divided and they had turned away from the one who had given them the land that they were on. And now they were in no man's land, standing between what was good and what wasn't, standing between two gods. After repairing the altar, Elijah wants to make sure that no one would accuse him of some sort of trickery or magic. So he drenches the altar with water three times. And then he prays. And he prays that God will manifest his power and his glory. And he prays that God's chosen people would turn their hearts back to him. And God answered Elijah's prayer. He wasn't silent and lifeless like Baal was. God responded and we're told that the fire of the Lord fell. I imagine that there was a blinding light and a loud booming sound of thunder. And just like that, in a flash, the fire came down and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench, we're told. And literally, nothing was left. They didn't need to clean up. They didn't need a cleanup crew because it was all gone. And God had proved that once and for all, he is real. He is powerful. And he is the true and living God. And he showed that Elijah was his true prophet and messenger. And this demonstration of God's power had a tremendous impact on the people of Israel. We're told in verse 39 that when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. You know, on a bit of a side note, uh, I don't think that we should overlook the fact that archaeological discoveries almost always depict Baal as a bull. And the people back then thought of him as that image. And by sacrificing this bull on the altar, I think that God was doing so much more than just showing his power. I also think that he was giving the people a visual aid of what he does to other gods. I also think that we need to read this story as a cautionary tale because there's an important lesson in here for all of us. We are all guilty of thinking that there is safety at times in hanging out in no man's land. We're guilty at times of sitting on the fence. And yet, if we learn anything from this battle and from this story, it's that the most dangerous place to be during any battle is right in between the two warring sides. And you have to make a decision as to whose side you're going to be on and the consequences of not choosing is always disastrous. It's my prayer this morning that these words and this story has been meaningful to you. I pray that if you find yourself in any area of your life living in a no man's land, I pray this morning that you would choose the one true God over whatever the other option is. He's proven himself. He will continue to prove himself. And I pray that you will claim the power and the might that he has. Lord bless, thank you so much for listening to this. Pray that you would have a great week.